Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is electrically excited synchronous motors. Our objective is to discuss the construction and theory of operation of electrically excited synchronous motors, as well as examine the mechanical and electrical properties while in operation. We'll additionally examine how field strength influences pull-out torque and performance at various load conditions. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewer has watched the Motors and Generators playlist in its intended sequence and comes fully armed with an understanding of the motor family tree, electromagnetic interaction, the state of rotating magnetic field, and rotating mechanical power. Additionally, this lecture presumes the viewer has an intimate level of familiarity with the mechanical and electrical properties of three-phase AC squirrel cage induction motors. If you haven't watched these lectures yet, or only dimly recall their contents, Please bring yourself up to speed and return when you are so qualified. In the aforementioned lectures, we acquainted ourselves with a larger motor family tree, various properties common to all motors, and then like some heavily caffeinated squirrel, climbed high into the squirrel cage induction motor branch of the motor family tree and rattled every leaf, shook every twig, knocked out every bird nest, and gnawed every acorn until nothing was left. Today, we're going to climb back down and back up again to the electrically excited synchronous motor branch and do the exact same thing. Before we do so, let's pause at the split between three-phase AC induction motors and three-phase AC synchronous motors and discuss some commonalities for these two important styles of three-phase AC motors. Both synchronous and induction three-phase AC motors are characterized by a rotating magnetic field on the stator. The speed of the rotating stator magnetic field is known as the synchronous speed and is directly proportional to the excitation frequency and inversely proportional to the number of pole pairs per phase. Additionally, the direction of the rotating stator magnetic field can be reversed simply by interchanging any two stator leads inside a three-phase AC system. Lastly, one could determine rotating mechanical power in units watts as a product of torque in newton meters times rotational speed in units of RPM divided by the constant 9.55. These properties remain true for all three-phase AC motors, synchronous and induction. The division between the synchronous and induction split in the three-phase AC motor branch is based on performance with respect to the synchronous speed. As the name implies, the rotor speed of a synchronous motor, the topic of today's discussion, matches, follows, or is otherwise synchronized or locked in step with that of the stator rotating magnetic field, whereas the rotor speed of an induction motor is not. The rotor of an induction motor must necessarily slightly lag behind the synchronous speed for them to function at all, even in the no-load condition. It is for this reason induction motors are sometimes called asynchronous motors, meaning not synchronized. I say again, the rotor of a synchronous motor is synchronized with a state of rotating magnetic field, whereas the rotor of an induction motor is not. The rotor of an induction motor must necessarily lag behind the state of rotating field for them to function at all. This is to suggest that within their operational range, synchronous motors are fixed speed motors, whereas we might expect the rotor speed of induction motor to vary as a function of applied torque. Let us now leave this junction and climb up into the branches of the synchronous motor family and get to work wrecking this place. Within the synchronous motor branch, there are two main types, electrically excited synchronous motors and permanent magnet synchronous motors. Additionally, one might encounter reluctance and hysteresis style synchronous motors, but I'm reluctant, get it, to bring them into the discussion just yet. As one might expect, all members of the three-phase AC synchronous motor family, regardless of construction, make use of a rotating magnetic field in the stator. And inside their operational range, we should expect the rotor to remain synchronized or to perfectly match the synchronous speed of the rotating stator magnetic field. Given the fixed speed nature of synchronous motors, they make an ideal match for applications that necessitate perfectly timed coordination regardless of applied load. A classic example being a conveyor belt that needs to move at a constant speed, whether it's carrying a box of rice paper origami ballerinas or a crate of sledgehammers. As long as the load within the operational range, a synchronous motor should ideally maintain constant rotational speed. We'll return to discuss the qualification within the operational range in a moment. Both main classes of synchronous motors feature a magnet on the rotor, the principal difference being how that magnet is established. As implied by the title, a permanent magnet synchronous motor really does have a permanent magnet on the rotor and necessitates no additional accessory electrical connections. Whereas an electrically excited synchronous motor, the topic of today's discussion, features a coil of wire on the rotor core called the field between F1 and F2. When the field is energized by an external DC source known as an exciter, 
It establishes an electromagnet where the strength of the resultant magnetic field is proportional to the current flowing through the coil. More DC current means more magnet, less DC current means less magnet. Once established, the rotor electromagnet locks in with the state of rotating magnetic field and follows it around and around, matching the synchronous speed. For the purposes of this lecture, we're presuming the DC exciter is an external DC voltage source, like an independent battery. However, be aware other types of exciters exist, including those exciters mounted on the rotor. We'll examine three-phase AC rectifiers central to the operation of exciters in greater detail in later exciting lectures. Because an electrically excited synchronous motor necessitates both a three-phase AC source for the stator and another DC source for the rotor, you may hear them referred to as doubly excited synchronous motors. Getting DC electricity from a stationary external exciter to a rotating rotor presents us with a structural challenge not encountered with squirrel cage induction motors, which if you recall, operate using the principle of induction and do not necessitate an electrical connection to the rotor. Despite the advantages we've yet to discuss, this is perhaps the electrically excited synchronous motor's greatest weakness. How does one send electricity using two wires to something that revolves 360 degrees without twisting the wires into a knot? The device that allows one to do so is known as a slip ring. A slip ring is a means of electrical connection between a rotating and a stationary member. There are several different forms of slip rings, but the most basic configuration takes the form of conductive rings on the rotor shaft which provide electrical contact to the rotor coil. Stationary conductive brushes held in place by a spring and brush holder ride along the conductive rings such the field coil on the rotor maintains electrical contact with the stationary electrical inputs regardless of orientation. Brushes and slip rings require regular maintenance and will eventually wear out and need to be replaced. This adds an operational expense to electrically excited synchronous motors not encountered with squirrel cage induction motors. This being said, the independently adjustable field on an electrically excited synchronous motor presents distinct advantages. 1. Once the rotor magnetic field locks into the rotating stator magnetic field, electrically excited synchronous motors can be expected to maintain synchronous speed regardless of applied load inside its operational range. This is perhaps the single most recognizable feature of synchronous motors. Inside their operational range, they are constant speed motors, whether you load them up or underload them, they'll always maintain the constant speed. These devices are not magic though, and do have practical limits only under which they can perform as advertised and beyond which they catastrophically and violently fail. As load torque increases, the rotor remains in sync with the stator field, however it's pulled slightly out of alignment. As load torque further and further increases, the differential between the stator and rotor magnetic field increases and increases. Pull-out torque is the point at which a synchronous motor is so loaded that it pulls out of synchronization. A synchronous motor that loses synchronization is a truly awful experience as line current spikes and the motor's mechanical performance goes to hell. This is not an event you want to prolong, so synchronous motors necessitate out-of-step protection from this undesirable event. We'll examine synchronous motor protection schemes in greater detail in later lectures. Pull-out torque is roughly linearly dependent upon field strength, although there are practical limits to this relationship. At the upper limits of field excitation, we might expect the rotor electromagnet to reach saturation, where pull-out torque starts to flatline. A graph of pull-out torque as a function of field current intensity might look something like this. As field current increases, so does pull-out torque until it reaches saturation, where pull-out torque does not increase despite further increases in field current. As you are no doubt aware, increasing field strength current increases the strength of the magnetic field. This being said, only so many lines of magnetic force can fit into the iron rotor, which concentrates the magnetic lines of force. At a certain saturation point, the sponge is full and further increases in current don't yield increased magnetism. 2. Additionally, by varying field current and thus field intensity, one can also observe changes in line current and reactive power consumption for a given load condition. You'll recall squirrel cage induction motors necessitate the constant consumption of positive reactive power necessary to power the rotating magnetic field and drive the process of induction central to their operation. Electrically excited synchronous motors, in contrast, don't operate using induction, but rather have two independent interacting magnetic fields. If the rotor field is weak, the stator needs to draw reactive power as would a squirrel cage induction motor. If, however, the rotor field increases in strength, the stator doesn't need to consume as much reactive power, 
thus line current decreases and power factor increases. Additionally, one can overexcite the rotor so much that the stator appears to be capacitive in nature and supplies reactive power. This can be used to power factor correct other loads as we'll examine in the upcoming synchronous condensers lectures. For today's purposes, keep these graphs in mind. A graph of reactive power as a function of field current looks something like this. At low levels of rotor excitation, the synchronous motor draws positive reactive power and appears as an inductive load where current lags voltage. If field current increases, it draws less reactive power and the phase shift between voltage and current decreases. If field current is further increased, the synchronous motor switches roles and instead supplies negative reactive power and appears as a capacitive load where current leads voltage. This graph also implies an important fact. At a given load condition, field current can be so managed such that the synchronous motor neither draws nor supplies reactive power and voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another. This would be an occasion of unity power factor. Speaking of power factor, a graph of power factor as a function of field current looks something like this. At low levels of rotor excitation, the synchronous motor draws positive reactive power and has a low lagging power factor. If field current increases, it draws less reactive power and power factor increases. When field current is adjusted such that the synchronous motor neither draws nor supplies reactive power, power factor peaks out at one. Finally, as field current is further increased, the synchronous motor starts supplying increasing amounts of negative reactive power such that power factor decreases only in a leading fashion. Given the above described behavior of reactive power and power factor, a graph of line current as a function of field current for a given load condition looks something like this. At low levels of rotor excitation, the synchronous motor draws large amounts of lagging current accounting for both the real and positive reactive power components. If field current increases, it draws less reactive power, thus current magnitude and phase shift decrease. When field current is adjusted such that the synchronous motor neither draws nor supplies reactive power, current bottoms out and is perfectly in phase with voltage. Finally, as field current is further increased, the synchronous motor starts supplying increasing amounts of negative reactive power, thus current magnitude increases and phase shift increases only in a leading fashion. The graphs of power factor and line current magnitude as a function of field current are essentially inverses of one another, as you might expect. You note I've included a DC overbar in field current, emphasizing field current drawn by the rotor is DC. Similarly, I've included an AC overbar in line current, emphasizing line current drawn by the stator is AC. Do not expect these helpful reminders in a field or lab environment.